You are all welcome to take a seat. My name is Rachel, and I'm just so glad to be with all of you here this morning. If you're watching online, I'd like to say a special um, welcome to you. We're glad that you're joining us from wherever, whenever you're watching this. And if you're a first time guest, I'd like to say welcome home. Um, like Sarah said, we have these green connect cards on the seat backs in front of you. If you fill it out and turn it into the green table at guest services after service, we would like to give you a free gift. Um, if you don't know, our mission here at Meadows Church is to lead people to Christ and their God-given purpose. And a couple weeks ago, we got to celebrate as 17 people publicly declared their love to Jesus. Yeah. So we have a highlight of it, and we're going to watch it right now. So turn to the screen. some praise up for that. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I can't help but just smile and feel such joy when I watch those people go under and then come back up 
It's just, it's wow, nothing like that. Um, and I just want to thank you to those of you that are giving here at Meadows because what you're giving to is life change. You're giving to, to people like that so that we can serve people like that and just do some really awesome things like that. So thank you so much for giving. And if you want to give, there are three ways you can do so. Um, there's a vase up here in the front and a vase in the back. And you can also give online or text to give. Um, and Sarah also talked about our one-for-one one ministry. If you haven't had the chance to put a dollar up up here yet, you can do that now. Um, I'm gonna kind of explain it to you. You already did, but might as well just explain it again, right? Um, so what this ministry is, it's we put a dollar in the bucket every week, and at the end of the month, we add up all the dollars and we give it to someone that you guys nominate. And this person doesn't come to Meadows Church. They might not know Jesus. Um, they're probably going through a really hard time or something surprised them and they need a little bit of help. And when you guys nominate them and they're picked, you get to give the check to them for however much money we gathered up throughout the rest or through the month. And I just love this ministry and hearing the stories that come from it. So I just want to thank you to all of all of you that have given to it before. Um, and now we're going to move into a time of prayer. If you ever need prayer, there are prayer warriors here throughout the service, and they'll come out again after the service. But the prayer room is off here. Um, it'll be to your guys' left, I guess. Feel free to go there anytime or wait until after service. And if you're watching online, you can text prayer now to 474747, and a prayer warrior will um, reach back to you. And again, if you ever need prayer throughout the week, you can text prayer now to that number as well, and a prayer warrior will pray with you throughout the week. So really cool, and I really, really encourage you all to take advantage of the prayer warriors we have here because they're just, I don't know, if you've never prayed with them, you need to because something crazy happens when you um, enter into that space with them. So now we're going to go to the Father in prayer, and at the end, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together, and the words will be on the screen behind me if you need them. Jesus, I just thank you so much for each and every person that walked through the doors this morning. I thank you that... Um, they have dedicated this time to you, to learn more about you, to grow closer to you, and I pray that you would just honor and bless that. I pray that you would be with Pastor Monty as he speaks to us all this morning. I pray that the words um, that come out of his mouth would be from you and that it would be so evident to us. I pray that as he speaks, um, chains would be broken, lies would, would, would be cast out, and shame would just be left at the door, Father. I pray that we would all leave here new um, and just in a better place than we were when we came in. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen and amen. Church, it is good to be with you. My name is Monty, one of the pastors at Meadows. And let's just start off. Turn to somebody that you're close to and just tell them I'm for you. Tell them I'm for you. Say I'm for you. They need to know that you're for them. Online, you're watching right now. I need you to type in the comments, I am for you. Your neighbor across the state or the world will hear that and see that. We want to be a church that is known for what we're for. In a world, this is what this series is all about, know what you're for, in a world where so many people clamor and yell about, I'm against this and I hate that and, and are so vocal about that, I can't help but believe that God wants us to be the opposite. I, I think he wants us to be about what we're for as a church and as a person. Like, like I'll just tell you, I am for ice cream. Okay, I'm for it, I love it. Yeah, who, who's for ice cream, okay? Oh my gosh, a lot of you have your hands down. I, I don't even get it. I don't get you. I do not get, I love you, but I don't get you, okay? I'm, I'm for it. Hard, hard serve, soft serve, I don't care. Jake, my son and I had a date night last night, went and got some wings, because that's what guys do. And then he said, Dad, let's go to Dairy Queen. He did not tell me twice, did you, Jake? We washed some wings down with some ice cream. It was awesome. I'm for it. So um, we, uh, I, I'll tell you a quick story about this week that uh, you might find humorous. I, uh, I was driving in my car uh, down a kind of a main road in town, and the, I, I can't, this is more of a confession maybe. I was probably going 43, 44 miles an hour, something like that, and the sign on the side of the road, you know, the speed limit sign, those things, it said 35. Now understand something. 
I think the sign's wrong. That's what I think. Because it does, it, that would be way too slow for this area of town. If I was mayor, I'd do things way differently, by the way. So, but I'm not. So, and there's a reason for that. So, I'm, I guess you could say, technically breaking the speed limit as I'm driving down this kind of main road. And I'm driving, and all of a sudden a guy passes me in the left lane, which is normally my lane, by the way. But he's in the left lane. He passes my car like I'm standing still. I, he had to be going 70. And I thought to myself, oh my God, are you kidding me? Who's he think he is? And I said, I'm a pastor, so I got really religious. And I said, God, I pray that up over the hill that we're approaching, that there's cops on the other side and this guy gets busted. And so we approach, we get over the hill. Guess what? Guess what's on the other side? Nothing. No police anywhere. I'm like, God, why don't you answer my... And he was so... So we get over the hill and he doesn't get busted. And I thought to myself, that is... Where's the justice in that? And is, do you hear how hip... Hip... Hippotic? What? Thank you. Yes, what she said. Uh, yes, that word. So you hear the hypocrisy in that? Like, I'm speeding, but yet I can't, I'm appalled that this guy's not getting busted. It isn't, isn't this what we do, by the way? We, we kind of, we, we look at other people and we can kind of see the, their faults and kind of point them out. But then we kind of ignore maybe some things that are going on in our life. Am I, am I the only one who does this? I don't know. But I mean, I, I can be guilty of that. And maybe you can be too. But, but that, this is what I, this, and we say to ourselves, where's the justice? You know, we, we all want justice. You do and I do. In, in atrocities that happen in our world, we want justice, don't we? Like, we, it's even in the Pledge of Allegiance, right? I, I mean, I said that every day in Catholic grade school. That's, that's a whole nother sermon. But in Catholic grade school, every day we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance, and it was right in the end of it. I mean, let's say it together. Not the whole thing, just the end. Like, we are one nation, say it with me, under God, indivisible, with liberty and, and justice for all. What do you think of when you hear that? Now, if you thought, gosh, I, I think of a uh, Metallica album, man, you're in the right church. I love you. So, uh, so <laughs> the, and we want justice. By the way, since I'm confessing to you this morning, I'll just tell you something else. When I said the Pledge of Allegiance almost every day in grade school, here's how I would say it. I'm not kidding you. Even up till eighth grade, embarrassing. One nation under God, invisible, with liberty I mean, are you kidding? So I thought we were some magical nation that would reappear and disappear. I just, I got problems. I, that's how I said it. Anyway, so um, ju we want justice. You and I want justice. We, we want justice. And, and, and the series, or not the series, but the title of today's message is, and justice for all, what you just said. What is the definition? Let, let's look at it really quick. Justice. Say justice. Yeah. The ideal of fairness and impartiality. It's a term for what is right and how things should be, right? When something is right, when, when, the, when the right thing happens, justice is served, right? But here's the issue. What I think is right and what you think is right, it could be two different things, right? Right? For example, like what I think is right when I order a steak, what's right is ordering it medium rare, okay? Who's with me? Who loves Jesus? Yeah, yeah, most of you. Now, if you're ordering your steak, okay, if you're ordering your steak medium well or God forsake you, well done. I mean, I don't, so, but who's right? You say, you say that's the way it should be. And I say medium rare is the way it should be. So who's right? Well, I mean, I'm right, but I mean, but you think you're right. And by the way, if you're ordering it medium well, and then you put steak sauce on it, you have a demon. I mean, I, you, you have a demon. I mean, we need to cast it out after the service, okay? That is wrong on a lot of levels. And if it's ketchup, oh my gosh. Okay, so, <laughs> don't, don't. Okay, so, but, but that's the problem. See, we set the standard for what we think is just. But here's the thing. We don't set that standard. God does, okay? Th that's why we gotta go to God's word because what I think is just and what you think is just are gonna be two different things. So it's so interesting, isn't it? We believe that God is a God of love, and he is. We believe that God is holy, and he is. But, but God is also just, and this is something that maybe we maybe need to talk about a little bit more. This is going to relate to your life in ways that you can't even imagine. So let me give you a couple of scriptures. I could give you probably 30 of them, but we don't have that kind of time. I'll give you two that set the stage for, to let you know that God is a God of justice. Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, the, the, the last book of the law or the Torah, the first five books. So Deuteronomy 32.4, the rock his work is perfect, talking about God. All his ways are justice. There it is. A God of faithfulness and um, without iniquity. Just, there it is again, and upright is he. 
That is who God is. Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Talking about God's throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So, so, so we don't get to define justice. We don't get to do it. Pursuing biblical justice, I wrote this down. Pursuing biblical justice means we follow God's way to make right that which is wrong. So, and by the way, you and I, what we think is just, we agree on most things. You and I do. I, in fact, I, I would tell you that you and I, and anybody watching online or listening online right now, we all agree on probably 95% of everything. We do. So, so like, I'll give you an example. Raise your hand if you're with me and you agree with me that, that selling another human being is wrong. Do you believe that's wrong? Okay, yeah. Hands up. Put the hand raise emoji up in online. We agree that. Okay, thank you. So you would also agree. I mean, I could name up a ton of things. Child abuse. We all agree that's wrong. Murder. We all agree that's wrong. Stealing. We all agree that's wrong. Uh, exploiting the vulnerable. We all agree that's wrong. We agree on most things. See, what the, what, what the devil will do is he'll, he'll divide us on, on the minority, on the things that we don't agree with. We agree on almost everything you and I do. We do. But, but, but I put down, we, we, a spotlight seems to be on the small percentage of things that we're against. And, and can we admit technology hasn't raised the bar, but has lowered the bar to share the opinion of what we think is important, right? Is, am, I, am I preaching just, I mean, it has lowered the bar. It is information overload. It is opinion overload. This is what I think is important. This is what I think is right. And people are sharing all over the place. And can we agree that the reason we think something is important or the reason that we think a certain way about some sort of issue, whatever that is, you fill in the blank, here's why we believe what we believe. It's based on the, our perception. And we all have different ones. It's based on the lens that we look through. And all our lenses are different. It's based on your background. It's based on your education. It's based on your upbringing. It's based on your past experience. It's based on all that. And from those things, you have these, these emotions that come out about certain topics and about certain feelings. That, that's why. And the emotions, they start, to, they start to come out of our mouths and they start to come off of our keyboards. And it gets a little bit crazy, these opinions and these feelings. But, but, but we have to set the stage right now. We don't need more opinions. We don't. We don't need more opinions. We need more truth. Truth doesn't come from your feelings. Truth comes from the Father. So that's where we're going. That's where you got to go. We got to go to the Bible. We got to go. We got to get biblical. I always say, everybody's a Christian until we get biblical, right? Well, you can't talk to me that way, Pastor. You can't judge me. I got it tattooed right on my left butt cheek, you know? Well, that's your first problem. So uh, <laughs> actually, you know what? I, I actually can probably. I mean, if I have a relationship with you and, and, and I've checked the log in my own eye, I can actually speak truth into your life in love. So I can actually do that. So you might want to get a tattoo on the other cheek that says, oops, you know, I mean, I'm just saying, shouldn't have got that tattoo. So anyway, um, <laughs> I, I want to take you to a book in the Old Testament called 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, it, it, the center of this story is David. Now, if I were to ask you, if you want attributes like David had, I mean, this is a man of faith. Right? This is a, this is, he was a young shepherd boy and he took down a giant. You know the story. I mean, he was one of the greatest kings of Israel, an incredible leader, leader of an army, won so many battles. Like, if you, if you could have some of David's attributes, raise your hand if you take them. Some of David's attributes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, of course you would. You should actually let me finish because you're also saying I want the attribute of a murderer, an adulterer, a thief, a liar. It, so I'm sorry, I should have finished. Anyway, so you don't want all of David's attributes. You don't want them all. And you're going to find them in this story. Um, I'm going to set the story up. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 2. I'm going to start in the first verse. And i got to set the stage. David, his army's out in battle. He's the king of Israel. Greatest nation at, at, at this point. He should be with the army in battle, but he's not. He's back at the palace. And not only is David back at the palace, but David is out meandering, kind of looking around, and he sees a woman bathing. Now, the woman's name is Bathsheba, which is just kind of funny because she's bathing in Bathsheba. Anyway, so that, that means nothing. So, um, but it, it just, just saying it's weird. So, so David sees this woman. And David, this woman's married. She's actually married to Uriah, who's actually battling in the, in the, in the army. And, and, and David, um, how can I say this? Because this is a PG-13 church. I mean, I don't, you know, so David has a, a, a meeting with the woman, okay? And you know, little boom, chicka boom, boom, 
you know, go, okay. So um, that goes down, and then uh, Bathsheba's pregnant. So David thinks to himself, well, crap, this isn't good. So, so he, he hatches a plan. Man of God that David is, man after God's own heart. David thinks, you know, I'm going to get Uriah back from the battle, her husband, and I'm going to get him drunk. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get him hammered, and then I'm going to kind of, you know, say, hey, go hang out with your wife for a while. You know what I'm saying? So, so he arranges all this, and Uriah, you know, has a few too many. And, but Uriah won't go hang out with his wife because he doesn't think it's right. Uriah's like, I don't know if I should be, you know, having that kind of fun while my, my, my army and my soldiers are battling and, and doing, you know, living that, or basically putting themselves in harm's way while I'm back here. He goes, I can't do that. And David was like, dang it, come on, Uriah. So David was like, you know, okay, plan B, plan B, plan B. I know, I'll kill him. <laughs> okay, there's plan B. And that's exactly what David does. He kills Uriah. I mean, he doesn't personally kill him, but basically he arranges it, sets it up, makes sure that when Uriah goes back to the battle, that he's put on the front lines when the fighting is the most fierce. And it happened. And it was fierce, and the, the uh, opposition killed Uriah. So it's all good for David, right? His plan ultimately worked out. Now he's actually with Bathsheba. I mean, they've been hanging out. They've been hanging out now for six months. She's pregnant with their, with their child. It's all good, right? So this, this is where Nathan comes in. Nathan's a prophet from God, and God has directed Nathan to speak in, speak in to David's life. Because God is a God of justice, and is justice served when, you're, when, when David does these things? No. David, you're, you're, you're a king, but you don't get away with this stuff. And God won't allow it. God is a God of justice. And here's what happens. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David a story. He said, David, there were these two men in, in a certain town. One was a rich guy and one was a poor guy. The rich guy had a lot of sheep and cattle. But the poor guy... He owned nothing. All he had was one little lamb. And it's all he had. He raised it, and, and, and it grew up with his kids. And he it ate from the guy's plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it like a, a, a baby daughter. It's, okay, it's kind of weird, actually. But anyway, he really liked his little lamb. One day, a guest arrived at the home of, of the rich guy. So the rich guy, instead of, like, killing one of his many lambs or cattle, he actually goes to the poor guy and takes his only lamb and slaughters it. And he's going to feed that to his guest. I mean, check out David. David goes crazy. He hears this, and David was furious, the Bible says. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man that would do that, he deserves to die. He's worked. He is fired up. He's got to repay that guy. According to the law, he, he has to repay him four lambs for the lamb he took. Yeah, four lambs to the guy for, have, for, for having no pity. What David didn't realize in the story is the story was about him. David is blinded right now. He doesn't realize that the rich man is David. The poor man is Uriah. And that little lamb, well, that's Bathsheba that David would steal from Uriah. Let me continue. Then Nathan, he, he just says it to David because David ain't seeing it. David, you're the guy. You're the rich man. It's you I'm talking about. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you the king of Israel. I saved you from the power of Saul, the previous king. He saved him. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. I did that all for you. And if that wouldn't have been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then, David, have you despised the word of the Lord? Pause. The word of the Lord, it matters a lot to God because, well, it's his word. Like, it, it's from him. And I wonder if God looks down at us today and says, why are you despising my word? Why are you, you, know, you, why are you doing what my word says not to? Why? He, and, and not because he's mad at you, but because he loves you. He wants, he, wants, he wants to good things for you, right? Say, for me. Yes, for you. So, so he's, 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 Nathan's laying into David. Um, why have you despised the word of the Lord, done this horrible deed? You murdered Uriah. He just calls it out. You murdered Uriah the Hittite with a sword of the Ammonites, the enemy. And then you stole his wife. And from this time on, because there's consequences for our sin. From this time on, your family will live by the sword, David. Because you despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. I tell you what, it's amazing what sin will do, isn't it? You think about David's story. 
in a moment of weakness, I mean, it starts with a, a look, right? That's how it started. This, this look of lust. And what's it turn into? Thievery, lying, adultery, and murder. I'm telling you what, sin, it will come into your life as a guest. Soon it wants to be the master. And many times it is. Trust me, there's a lot of people in prison right now. You know what they're thinking? Holy crap, how did it get here? I mean, how did I end up here? Right? A lot of people that have gone through all kinds of struggles in their marriage and divorces and just hurt kids, broken families. I never dreamed it would get there. It was just a little, I just, I just it, was a, it was like a Facebook search. That's all it was. It was never supposed to, sin will come as a guest. It, it, will, it won't leave till it's the master. So David, in one fell swoop, he breaks literally half of the commandments. The, this, this man of God, it is, it is absolutely insane. And his focus, it's funny, and his focus is on that lamb. He's so mad. It's like, David, you killed a guy, okay? You, you kill. And by the way, David, if, if you're so just and you're so ticked off about that lamb getting killed, think about this for a second. The law, you know what the law demands? The law would demand, because of him and Bathsheba, what they did, the law would say, you two should be stoned. That's what it would say. Okay, not, not the Bob Marley kind, okay? I always got to clarify, it's Meadows Church. I don't know what you're thinking. But, but the dead kind. The, the, that's what the law says. But David's not really worried about justice. He's worried about himself. See, we're quick to minimize our faults. That's what I'm saying. I am, and you probably are too. Like, I'll minimize what my little issues that I got going on. But when I see something that you got going on that I don't like, I'm really going to highlight it. And this is what we're in the business of doing. And people get on what we call a soapbox. And they just go crazy about these topics that... And I'm not saying the topics aren't important. I'm not saying that. But, but you're going to hear a main point here that I, I, I believe will resonate with you deeply. We minimize things, and, and, and then we argue, and we highlight what matters to us. Well, masks are a big deal to me. Well, this person over here, they're not that big of a deal to them. Well, they should be. Well, vaccines, everybody should be getting a vaccine. Well, I mean, this person over here doesn't, they don't agree with that. Well, they should. Well, this is what I think about equality, and you should believe it. And this is what I think about diversity, and you should believe it. And this is what I think about global warming, and, and you should believe it. Every time that you start your big, fat truck, and those emissions shoot out, you're killing Mother Earth. Okay? And I don't want to debate global warming, but, but I, know the, I know the one who created the planet, and one day he's going to set it on fire. That's global warming, if you ask me. That's, I'm just saying. Okay, so anyway, that was a side thing there. Should, sometimes I say things. Anyway, so <laughs> David, you know, when David was confronted by Nathan, it was, a, it was a huge moment, critical. Some of you, you're in a huge moment right now. You don't even know it. You don't even know it. You're in a critical moment. You maybe know it deep down. It could be in your marriage. It could be with your children. It could be in school. It could be with a friend. It could be with God. And you are at a critical moment. David, when Nathan calls him out, and Nathan, David could have killed him for it. But Nathan said, I'm a man of God. God tells me to say it, I'm going to say it. And, 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 and what's David going to do? David, are you going to, are you going to humble yourself and say, you know what, my bad? Or are you going to stay proud and say, you know what, Nathan, I'll have you killed. That, that, you know, you're wrong. This is, this is what happened. Don't take ownership. Make excuses. Because people that make excuses, you already know this, they don't make a difference. Excuses. People that make excuses do not make a difference. And David, are you going to make an excuse? Let's see. 2 Samuel 12, 13, a few verses after we just finished. Then David confessed. David chose wisely. David humbled himself. He confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's a huge statement. I'm going to come back to that. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, yes, but, but the Lord has forgiven you. The Lord, our gracious Lord, he's forgiven you. He has forgiven you. David takes a path of righteousness in this moment. By the way, righteousness, that's really another word for justice, right? Justice means I want what is right done. Well, that's righteousness. The righteousness is the next right thing. So, so the key to righteousness, though, see, righteousness always begins with repentance. Always. It always does. Notice when David repented. Repented means he's changing his mind. Like David's like, oh my gosh, I, I sinned. I did a bad thing. I don't want to live that way anymore. I don't want to deceive anymore. I, I, I don't want to hide it anymore. I want to live a right way. That's repenting. It means you're turning and you're changing. So, but, but righteousness, if you want to live a righteous life, righteous life, it starts with repenting. It starts with changing a behavior, changing a mindset. And understand this. Do you know where repentance starts? It starts with confessing. It does. So, so righteousness begins with repentance. And repentance begins with what? Confessing. What does David do? The first thing it said, David confessed to Nathan. The gig is up. You're right. 
I've done this. I've been there. I've looked at that. I've talked to her. I've been with them. I, whatever it is, you, you fill in the blank. I took it. I did it. Confession is so huge. This is why the 12 steps of recovery are so incredibly huge for everybody. Not just the addicts or alcoholics. I mean, step four, you're writing everything down. It's huge. Huge. Step five, what are you doing? You're confessing it to someone else. Why? For healing. David was experiencing healing in the moment. And we live in such a crazy world right now where everybody's so focused on, I'm right and you're wrong and I'm right and you're wrong. And I'm like thinking to myself, God, we are the worst witness. Especially if we're saying we're a believer in Jesus. We, we need to focus less on being right and more on being righteous. Okay? That's what we need to do. You and I, we got to focus less on I'm right and you're wrong and mo more on being righteous. Well, how? We'll start with repentance. Well, how? Start by confessing something that you've been hiding or something that you've done. That's where it begins. My God. Here, I'll say it another way. We need to focus less on a person's position and more on the person. You need to focus less on their political stance and more on the person. Okay, that's what we need to do. Behind the keyboard that you're slamming down and behind the mouth that you're shouting out is a person that God created and Jesus died for. And we need to, we, we're losing sight of what's most important. My, I, so I'm reading in the Word of God this week with the, this group I'm in, and I'm reading Luke, and every time Jesus appeared after he resurrected from the dead, oh, by the way, that's a, that's a great story. So Jesus would appear, you know what he talked about? You can read it in Luke. He talked about the kingdom of God with them. That's what he said. Every time he appeared, he talked about the kingdom of God. He didn't talk about the worldly things, the earthly things, the temporal things. No, why? Because he knew they were temporal. They'd be here and gone, but the kingdom of God lasts forever. We have to start focusing on what God wants. We're getting caught up in the lies of the enemy's smokescreen. And we're, 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 we're shooting our own people. We're, we're killing our, the wounded. And it's like we're turning on each other. And the devil just sits back and says, I ain't got to do much. They're doing just fine by themselves. And we're losing it. I don't want us to. Do, and, 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 it's so, it's so, and it's so argumentative. Well, I'm going to be right. I'm going, to win the, I'm going to win the argument. Yeah, you might win the argument, but if you win the argument and lose the relationship, you've lost. You've lost. And I know families that are separated. I, you probably do too. People that don't talk to people because of the way somebody voted or what somebody feels about a mask mandate or a vaccine, or whatever it is, you fill in the blank. You know them. You know what's going on. And we will hate in the name of Jesus because of what somebody, because they take a position and we lose sight of the person. It, it, it's, it's crazy. We have to look past the deception that the devil is putting in front of us. You win the argument, you lose the relationship, you've lost. You've lost. David, he was done fighting it, done arguing. He appeals to God. God, I've sinned against you. He appeals to the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God. And what does God do? The Lord forgives David. You heard Nathan say it. But there were tragic consequences. Men, let me speak to you for a moment. Leaders of households, at least you should be. As a, as a, as a leader of a household, our sins, I mean, all sin separates us from God. But I tell you what, I think for the guys, I don't know. Sometimes we're selfish. I mean, I am. I'll speak for me. I'm a selfish person sometimes. And I forget that when I, when I do things that are apart from God, it is affecting my wife. It affects my children. It'll affect it, 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 grandkids, great-grandkids. It's generational. You, your, your little decision, David, to check out Bathsheba that day, it wasn't just about you, David. It, 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 well, it killed a guy. It, it separated a family. It, it, it killed a child. You'll see that. Man, we, we have to be, we, we got to be strong as the men of a, a household. We all do, but I just, I feel just compelled to speak to the men because I don't know. We just need to rise up and be the men that God created us to be. Murder was a constant threat to David's family. Did you know that? David's life, it was rough after this. His household rebelled against him. The baby that I just told you about, remember him and Bathsheba, the baby? She's probably six months pregnant, seven months pregnant. The baby died, lived seven days. There's consequences for sin. But here's the thing about God. It's, it, so they're, they're, that's, that's not good news. But here's the thing about God and his redemptive glory and his mercy and his love. David, God still loved David. I wrote down David still had a purpose. 
David was still anointed by God. David was still a man after God's own heart. David was still the king of Israel. He was still God's chosen guy. In fact, from David will come another son. His name would be Solomon. And Solomon would be the next king of Israel. He would build God's temple. And from his offspring, a man would be born named Jesus. The Messiah, the Savior of the world. And why do I tell you this? I tell you this because some of you, and I don't know what you got messed up in your life, but I bet there's something, and I don't know what it is, but maybe you've made a mess in an area of your life. Maybe there's an area of your life that, that I don't, and I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what your struggles are, but I just know this. From what I read about David's story and God with him, I know this. God can take what you broke, and God can make it beautiful. God can take the mess that you're in, and he can turn it into a miracle if you let him. If you turn to him, if you repent, I mean, that's what God will do. Some of you, you're ready to give up in an area of your life. You're like, it's over. My kid will never be this way. My, my, my wife will never, my husband will never, I'll never find. No, stop. Stop speaking death over your life. Start speaking life over your life. God, David, it should be over for him. And God's like, you're still my anointed. David, you are messed up, but you're my guy. And God looks at Meadows Church and he looks at you and he says, you are messed up but you're my girl and you're my guy and I love you and my plans for you are still good. We gotta understand the love of God. We gotta understand the justice of God too because you can't just ignore one and love the other. Oh, I love the grace of God. Well, God's also a wrathful God, but we don't wanna talk about that much from the stage because that doesn't fill up the seats, but he is a God of wrath, make no mistake. See, to understand God's justice, what you, what you really need to understand is sin. That's, that's the only way that you can truly understand the justice of God. Let me help. Sin is lawlessness, I wrote. It's rebellion. It goes against everything God stands for. Like he's holy, sin is unholy. It, it, it's a crime against God. Did you know that? Maybe you never heard it that way. Let's go back to what David said. Remember when Nathan said, hey, you're that guy, you're that guy. And what's the first thing that David said? Do you remember? He said, I have sinned against who? He said, the Lord. That's what he said. He didn't say Bathsheba. He, he could have, because he did. He didn't say Uriah. He could have. He did. He said, I've sinned against the Lord. I have committed a crime against God. A crime punishable by death and eternal separation from him, by the way. That's, so until we get the gravity of sin, we'll never, we'll never understand the gravity of grace. We never will. It goes against everything he stands for. And, and we judge other sinners, I wrote it down, and demand justice for what they're doing while ignoring the sin in our life and God's justice for us. I've done it. You know why you demand justice, by the way? Do you know why David demanded justice for that lamb? It's in your DNA. See, God demands justice. You're created in God's image. That's why when you see atrocities in the world and you see horrible things happen, you're like, that ain't right. That isn't right. That shouldn't happen. When, and when you hear the story yourself of the lamb and that rich guy would take it and he has all those, but he takes the one thing he had and kills it, it doesn't sit right with you because the DNA is in you. The justice is in you. And, and, and Nathan's telling David this story to get David to see his own life. David's immediate re repentant prayer was effective because by admitting his sin against God, not against anybody else, against God first and foremost, he acknowledged the righteousness of God. That's what David was doing. By the way, the reason I can tell you that David was repentant, because understand something, repentance is different than asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness is just, a, oh, it's, it's very important. It's a one-time act. But, it, but here's the thing. If you ask, you know what, forgive me. Forgive me for doing this. I won't do it again. And then, and then an hour later, you're looking at the pornography. Well, that's not, that's, that's just playing a game. You're not repenting. You're not turning from anything. You know, forgiveness, I'm sorry that I, I yelled at you or that I abused you. I won't do it again. But an hour later, you did it again. Well, that's not, those are just words then. That's not repentance. Repentance is truly changing. It's not perfection, but you truly want to go a different route. It is so different. We, we get, we're like, oh, we're asking for forgiveness of God. Forgive me, I'm good. And God's like, but, you, but, but righteousness starts with repentance and you're not repenting. Well, you know, God, you're forgiving God. So I'm going to keep, you know, I'll keep talking this way. I'll keep looking at that. I'll keep doing that. I'll keep whatever. The reason I can tell you David was, was repentant is because David was told the child was going to die, right? God said it through Nathan. You know what David did um, when the child was born? He fasted for an entire week and he begged God, God, don't do it. God, you keep my son alive. 
He, I mean, he was, they were, his, his staff is worried about him like, dang, David, are you all right? You seem a little off today. And David's rolling around on the ground in ash and sackcloth and he's not eating. He's like begging God. I know what you said, but please. And on the seventh day, the child dies. And you would think David would be like, come on, I repented. You know how we know he repented? Listen to what he did. The child dies, and even though David begged for the child to live, and you can read this yourself. In fact, I encourage you to keep the story going this week. David gets up, he gets dressed, and the first thing he does after he learns his child is dead, he goes and worships God. I, I, that blows me away. See, some people struggle. It, it, I, it hurts my heart when people say, well, I, I can't go to church. I'm going through all this struggle. I'm like, that's why you should come. That's, why, that, that's when you should run to the church. It, the devil wins every time. Well, I'm, I got so much going on. And, uh, my life is in such disarray. I can't, I can't come. I'm like, oh my God, you're believing a lie. You're, the, the, very, the very body that you need to run to is the bride of Christ. It's so crazy the way the devil will work on our minds to keep us away from what God has for us. David worships, worships God. Son is dead. I wrote it down. David didn't confuse the cruelty of life with the love that is God. Life is harsh. Yeah? Life's hard. Life isn't fair. If you have kids, you've been told that over and over, haven't you? That's not fair. Well, that isn't fair. He got to do it. That's not fair. I still, I swear, I, four years ago, I said I wanted to make a t-shirt. I haven't done it yet. But it would say, it would say, life's not fair. I don't care. Love dad. Okay? I just, I'm just pray about that. I think it'd be great. So, um, it isn't fair. Look at our world. Sex trafficking, child prostitution, drug trafficking, terrorist camps. I mean, no, it's not fair. But, but the mo you know the most unfair thing? The most unfair thing that ever happened? It, it happened to Jesus. If anybody could scream about life not being fair, it'd be the Son of God. Isaiah was a prophet who lived hundreds of years before Jesus ever walked the earth. He writes a, he writes a prophecy a foretelling of what's going to happen. What's, what's crazy about prophecy is everything that's been predicted in the Bible so far has come true, by the way. Um, and everything that hasn't come true yet will, guaranteed. I guarantee you it will. So Isaiah's writing stuff down. He's writing about a crucifixion and how they pierced Jesus' hands. That's so crazy. Do you know when Isaiah wrote that? Crucifixion didn't exist. It wasn't even a thing. It, did, it, it wasn't. It did not exist. So how is Isaiah? Anyway, so God, it's pretty good. So Listen to Isaiah 53. This is unfair, by the way. He was pierced for our rebellion. Remember, sin is rebellion against God. He's crushed for our sins, for my sins. He's beaten so we could be made whole. Does that seem right? He's whipped so I can be healed. All of us, like sheep, we've strayed. You know you have. I know I have. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the sins of all of us. That is totally not fair. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he, Jesus doesn't fight it, never says a word, the Bible says. He's led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, Jesus doesn't open his mouth. Verse 8, don't miss it. Unjustly condemned. The opposite of justice is happening right here. You don't get more, more unjust than what I'm describing to you. Unjustly condemned, he's led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. No one cared that his life was cut short in midstream. He struck down for our rebellion, my rebellion. He'd done no wrong, never deceived anyone ever. And he's buried like a criminal. Even Jesus knew it wasn't fair. You know when Jesus was nailed to the cross? This is insane. So he's up on the cross hanging there, and Jesus knows it's not fair. In fact, in his humanity, he cries out to the Father, Why? Why? I don't, Father, all I did was love him. All I did was lead him. All I did was teach him. All I did was feed him. All I did was heal him. That's all I ever did. I didn't hurt anybody. I loved everybody. I loved the, I loved the people nobody loved. Why? He is crying out. Can I tell you why? Because God is for you. That's why. Father's for you. The Father even goes against his justice and says, I gotta make a way. 
I got to build a bridge. I'm for you. He's not against you. He's not mad at you. He brought you here. He is for you. God is for you. God is for you. God is for you. God is seeking you today. Online, watching, listening, on the treadmill, wherever you're at, he seeks you today. You maybe thought, well, I was seeking God today. Now, nah, he more so was seeking you. There's another unrighteous dude in the Bible named Zacchaeus. Very unrighteous, a thief. Nobody liked him. One day, Jesus was coming through the town, and Zacchaeus, you might know the story, he climbs up this tree just to get close to Jesus because he's seeking Jesus. But the reality is, Jesus was seeking him. Why do you think Jesus walked through that, by, by that tree? Why do you think Jesus walked through that town? See, Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. See, what I'm telling you this is, the, the Son of God, he came to seek and save those who are lost. Those who are broken. Those who are hurting, is that you? Those who are suffering, those who are depressed, those who are, are dying on the inside, those who are sick, those who are lonely. And if any of that describes you, I'm telling you, God brought you here because He has not given up on you. And He won't. He won't stop chasing you. I'm for you. I am for you. I am for you. He's for me. And He's for you. God help us focus less on being right more on being righteous rather than ranting we need to be repenting father instead of fighting and arguing about a position or a politic we need to start loving people God we got to get back to loving people we can have opinions you can and you should just don't forget don't make the opinion more important than the person well I don't you know it is a crazy time pastor I agree but you know, eventually the strife will be better and eventually things will start to settle down and eventually things will get back to normal. Okay, I have a public service announcement. Normal has left the freaking building and normal's not coming back. But you know who is coming back? His name is Jesus. He's coming back. So what if we got about the Father's business? What if we start seeking Him and He's seeking us and we collide? and we embrace, and the world will never be the same. That act on the cross, that unfair, that unjust, that... Thank God he's not fair. Thank God he allows unfair things to happen. That's why I have hope, and that's why you have hope too. Mercy of God, the mercy, that is not getting what I deserve and what you deserve. What we deserve is the wrath of God. Well, God's not a wrathful God, that's Old Testament. No, God doesn't change. Covenants might change. God don't change. He is a God of love and He's a God of wrath. He is both. And people who are separated from Jesus, they'll feel the wrath. I don't want that to be anybody in this room or anybody watching online or anybody that I ever know, anybody that I like, anybody that I dislike. I don't want it. Mercy is not getting what I deserve, the wrath of God. Grace, the grace that's being offered to you and I today, is getting what I don't deserve, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do you know that when you call on the name of Jesus and you believe in the story of him being on the cross and being dead, and even more importantly, get this, because thousands died on a cross. That's not the big miracle. The big miracle is what happened three days later, right? That's the biggie. Say, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Three days later, when the women went to, women went to anoint Jesus, because that's what they were doing, it's, you got to read the Gospels. you got to read the end. Nobody expected nobody. Nobody did. Peter didn't expect it. Mary didn't. The, Mary, his mom expected him to be dead three days later. But guess what? When the stone was rolled away and they peeked in the tomb, you know what was there? Nobody. So guess what happened? The greatest miracle in history. Jesus Christ was no longer dead. Okay, I'm going to say it again. I, Jesus Christ was no longer dead. He was alive. That's why we can have hope. That's why we get grace. That's why we get mercy. That's our only hope. So when you sell out to that, the Holy Spirit enters into you. And then when God looks at you, He doesn't see your sin. He sees His Son. I'm going to say that again when you call on the name of Jesus and repentance is part of that. Please understand this. This is the part that's being left out of the gospel, I think, a lot. Oh, I'm good. I believe. Okay, the devil's good. Then he believes. The devil hasn't repented. 
The devil hasn't turned from anything he's doing. The devil's not now following Jesus. It's more than just saying, I cognitively believe in the Son of God. That's, it starts there. But the repentance has to be a part of it. So, so he sees not your sin, but his son. Gosh, this is huge. Righteousness, Romans 3.22, righteousness from God comes by faith in Christ alone. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He was dead, but now He lives. And that when we call on His name and ask His Spirit to come into us and make us new, and you can do that today, He will do it. He'll set you free. And the Holy Spirit in you, He's what compels you and helps you turn from these ways that you used to, that you used to live. You won't be perfect. You'll struggle. But that's why the Spirit helps you, and He's in you. You can have that today. It's, it's, it's so unfair. And I, I'm so grateful that God wasn't fair. That God said, I'm going to make a way for these guys. They're so jacked up. They, they, they deserve sin, death, and damnation. But I'm just going to send you, Jesus. It's, it's like, I want you to picture this. And this is my last illustration. I want you to picture this. I want you to picture with all your heart like this is real. When you leave here today, and you get in a car, and you leave the parking lot, you're watching, you're listening online. The next time you get in your vehicle and you drive somewhere, I want you to think about this. Your phone rings. You glance down at your phone. It's a number you don't recognize. And you're thinking about it. Gosh, who is that? And you're driving and you kind of glance down again. You do the double take because you're like, I don't recognize that number. And the second you glance down the second time, there's a child in the road and you kill him. You didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. But you did it nonetheless. You know it. You know you were negligent, you were wrong, and now a child is dead. So what's justice say? Justice says you, have to, you gotta pay for your crime, right? You gotta, pay, you gotta be punished for what you did. Even you would say that. If you were driving the car, you'd say, you know what? Man, it, it, was, it was an accident, but yeah, I mean, his parents, they deserve justice, and that kid's family deserves justice, and yeah, yeah I'm not gonna fight it. Judge, I plead guilty. I, 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 it was manslaughter. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do it. You, that, that's what would happen. And the judge would look at you and say, all right, well, manslaughter, that's 20 years to life. I don't know if that's what it is. I'm just guessing. So you're standing there before the judge and he's getting ready to rain down the verdict on you. You're, you're freaked out, of course. You didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. You know, you just glanced for a second, but that's all it took for the kid to die. And just as the judge is ready to slam down the verdict, the kid's father stands up and he says, you know what? Is there any way we can just get rid of all the charges? Is there any way we can just kind of just move forward and let this person, you, be free? Would that be fair? Is just, does that serve justice? The judge doesn't think so. The judge is like, no, 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 we can't, we can't just do that. I mean, the child is dead. Justice needs to be served. Someone has got to go. And now let's just take it a step farther. So the dad says, I'll go. <laughs> the courtroom's like, what the, what are you doing? Your, ki your kid's dead. You're the victim. What are you doing? You, it's one thing to say, let the guy free, but you're going to go to jail for 20 plus years for a crime committed against you? That's the opposite of justice. That's not fair. Why would you do that? That's what Jesus did. It's insane. It is insanity. Christ, what are you doing? You've never done, and God allows it. Go, take him. You, you leave. Just leave the courtroom. You're good. Can you imagine your feeling? You're expecting to spend maybe the rest of your life in jail, and like that, you're you're free. And then that guy, he's gonna serve your time. This is the glory of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what he wants you to sell out to. God sent His Son Jesus to Earth to pay a penalty that we can't pay and made salvation available to all. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, there it is. If we confess our sins, don't miss it. Confession, well, that's the beginning of repentance. And repentance is the beginning of righteousness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. <laughs> he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, what? Unrighteousness. No unrighteous people will ever meet Jesus in heaven. None. 
I can't make myself unrighteous. I can't do it. I'm a pastor and I still can't do it. It's going to take somebody else to do it for me. It's got to be Jesus. It's got to be him in me. That way when God looks at Monty and says, God, Monty, you speed a lot. And then you kind of, you kind of cuss in your mind. You don't say it out loud, but you cuss in your mind. And I'm like, yeah, God, I do, I, I do that. But you know what? I don't see any of that. Because all I can see right now is the glory of my son. That's all I can see in you. You don't act like him a lot sometimes, but, I, but he's in you. So you know what? You're free. Jesus, he's already spent the time. He's already paid the price. You're good. Here's my prayer. I think it's easy to come and hear a message, but I want to put feet to the fire. I want to put action to the message. And I'm going to ask you, as we just play underneath, I'm going to ask that you would, on the note cards, they're all on your chairs. What do you need to admit or confess? What do you need to admit or confess? The, 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 the beginning of repentance is confession. And that leads to righteousness. You don't need to put, you can put your name on it if you want. You don't have to. And in a moment, we'll, we're going to dim the lights. And I'm going to have the prayer team come up. In fact, the prayer team. And we have extra prayer warriors today because here's my prayer. As you come up and you drop your confession in here, some of you are going to take it a step farther. You're going to confess out loud and admit some things to somebody that you trust. You know it's confidential. So we're going to have this place lined with prayer warriors. So as they're coming up, keep coming up. Prayer team, come up. And you don't have to pray with them. And you don't even have to confess. Maybe you have a separate prayer request today. It's not a confession, but you need prayer. That's what we're here for. That's what we want. Maybe you need to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender your life to him. Online, type I choose Jesus in the comments. We'll connect with you. In the room, the green connect cards. Mark your decision on the card. We'll follow up with you. We will, we will, we will, we'll walk alongside you. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make, but it's only the beginning. So here's what we're going to do. You're writing. Some of you are already writing. Praise God for that. Some of you, the devil's going to want you to put your card down. And what he wants you to do is immediately when I'm done praying up here, he wants you to beeline for the door and get in your car as quick as you can and get out of here. I pray with everything in me, you don't let the devil win. I pray with everything in me, you know how much God is for you and that he's in love with you and that he wants to connect with you today. He loves when you confess to him. He loves when you confess to others, knowing it's safe and confidential. And maybe it's not a confession again, maybe it's just another prayer request, whatever it is. Let's get real. Let's put some traction to the message today. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your word and your truth. My gosh, so you're a God of justice. But you made an exception, didn't you? You let, some, you let something pretty unjust happen with your son actually with 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 the love of your life your son who didn't do anything so that in us you could do everything father for people that need to sell out to to your son jesus christ i pray that it happens today the gospel says anybody who calls in the name of the lord jesus christ believes receives Admit, admit, confess, believe it, and choose to start living the life that God purposed and planned, the righteousness. There's only one way we're going to live a righteous life, and that is with Christ in us. It is impossible to be righteous without Jesus. That is impossible. In fact, that is torture. So, I'm praying for everybody. There's people that have a lot of different steps here. I pray everybody will fill out a card and just write, confess, admit things they, they've screwed up. Admit like David, I've, I've, I've committed a crime against the Lord. I've committed a crime against my loved ones. There's no judgment here, God. We all come together as sinners. I want to be a sinner saved by grace, being made more like Christ every day. So give people the courage to fill out a card. And I pray, pray, pray with everything in me, Father, that many will have the courage after they drop their card in one of these buckets up here, that they'll step with a prayer warrior. And maybe they won't say a word. They might just be silent and crying. It's okay. You want to hear from them. You love them. You're not mad at them. <laughs> You're not down at them. You died for them. Why? Because you're for us. God, I thank you from the, from, on behalf of everybody here for being for us. Because you are, we can declare that the best is yet to come, despite what we face in this world, because this world is not fair. But I thank God that you are just, and I thank God that you gave us a plan a way out through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray and we all say, amen. 
Hey, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today. But don't stop there. I invite you to like or subscribe to our social channels. That way you don't miss a single video, update, or message. But not only that, would you consider sharing this message with a friend, coworker, family member? I mean, so many people need hope and encouragement and you have the ability to bring it directly to them. Finally, one more thing. I wanna ask that you would consider giving financially to this ministry. I mean, God has done so much, but yet we believe he wants to do so much more, like so many more people he wants to reach, so much more hope he wants to give, so many more lives that he wants to save, and your investment can help make that happen. So again, thank you so much. I love you, and God loves you more. God bless you.